If Al Capone, two-gun Crowley, Dutch Schultz, and the desperate men and women behind prison walls don't blame themselves for anything, what about the people with whom you and I come in contact? John Wanamaker, founder of the stores that bear his name, once confessed, I learned 30 years ago that it is foolish to scold. I have enough trouble overcoming my own limitations without fretting over the fact that God has not seen fit to distribute evenly the gift of intelligence. Criticism is futile because it puts a person on the defensive and usually makes him strive to justify himself. Criticism is dangerous because it wounds a person's precious pride, hurts his sense of importance, and arouses resentment. B.F. Skinner, the world-famous psychologist, proved through his experiments that an animal rewarded for good behavior will learn much more rapidly and retain what it learns far more effectively than an animal punished for bad behavior. Welcome back to the flight. Hit that subscription button, buddy, and stay updated with everything that's trending in Guyana and the diaspora. Thanks. If by the time you have finished listening to the first three chapters of this book, if you aren't then a little better equipped to meet life situations, then I shall consider this book to be a total failure so far as you are concerned. For the great aim of education, said Herbert Spencer, is not knowledge, but action. And this is an action book. How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Part one, fundamental techniques in handling people. Chapter one, if you want to gather honey, don't kick over the beehive. On May 7, 1931, the most sensational manhunt New York City had ever known had come to its climax. After weeks of search, Two-Gun Crowley, the killer, the gunman who didn't smoke or drink, was at bay, trapped in his sweetheart's apartment on West End Avenue. 150 policemen and detectives laid siege to his top floor hideaway. They chopped holes in the roof. They tried to smoke out Crowley, the cop killer, with tear gas. Then they mounted their machine guns on surrounding buildings, and for more than an hour, one of New York's fine residential areas reverberated with a crack of pistol fire and the rat-tat-tat of machine guns. Crowley, crouching behind an overstuffed chair, fired incessantly at the police. 10,000 excited people watched the battle. Nothing like it had ever been seen before on the sidewalks of New York. When Crowley was captured, Police Commissioner E.P. Mulrooney declared that the two-gun desperado was one of the most dangerous criminals ever encountered in the history of New York. He will kill, said the commissioner, at the drop of a feather. But how did two-gun Crowley regard himself? We know because while the police were firing into his apartment, he wrote a letter addressed to whom it may concern. And as he wrote, the blood flowing from his wounds left a crimson trail on the paper. In this letter, Crowley said, Under my coat is a weary heart, but a kind one, one that would do nobody any harm. A short time before this, Crowley had been having a necking party with his girlfriend on a country road out on Long Island. Suddenly, a policeman walked up to the car and said, Let me see your license. Without saying a word, Crowley drew his gun and cut the policeman down with a shower of lead. As the dying officer fell, Crowley leaped out of the car, grabbed the officer's revolver, and fired another bullet into the prostrate body. And that was the killer who said, under my coat is a weary heart, but a kind one, one that would do nobody any harm. Crowley was sentenced to the electric chair. When he arrived at the death house in Sing Sing, did he say, this is what I get for killing people? No, he said, this is what I get for defending myself. The point of the story is this. Two-Gun Crowley didn't blame himself for anything. Is that an unusual attitude among criminals? If you think so, listen to this. I have spent the best years of my life giving people the lighter pleasures, helping them have a good time, and all I get is abuse, the existence of a hunted man. That's Al Capone speaking. Yes, America's most notorious public enemy, the most sinister gang leader who ever shot up Chicago. Capone didn't condemn himself. 
he actually regarded himself as a public benefactor, an unappreciated and misunderstood public benefactor. And so did Dutch Schultz before he crumpled up under gangster bullets in Newark. Dutch Schultz, one of New York's most notorious rats, said in a newspaper interview that he was a public benefactor, and he believed it. I've had some interesting correspondence with Louis Laws, who was warden of New York's infamous Sing Sing prison for many years on this subject, and he declared that few of the criminals in Sing Sing regard themselves as bad men. They are just as human as you and I. So they rationalize, they explain. They can tell you why they had to crack a safe or be quick on the trigger finger. Most of them attempt by a form of reasoning fallacious or logical to justify their antisocial acts even to themselves, consequently stoutly maintaining that they should never have been imprisoned at all. If Al Capone, Two-Gun Crowley, Dutch Schultz, and the desperate men and women behind prison walls don't blame themselves for anything, what about the people with whom you and I come in contact? John Wanamaker, founder of the stores that bear his name, once confessed, I learned 30 years ago that it is foolish to scold. I have enough trouble overcoming my own limitations without fretting over the fact that God has not seen fit to distribute evenly the gift of intelligence. Wanamaker learned this lesson early, but I personally had to blunder through this old world for a third of a century before it even began to dawn upon me that 99 times out of 100, people don't criticize themselves for anything, no matter how wrong it may be. Criticism is futile because it puts a person on the defensive and usually makes him strive to justify himself. Criticism is dangerous because it wounds a person's precious pride, hurts his sense of importance, and arouses resentment. B.F. Skinner, the world-famous psychologist, proved through his experiments that an animal rewarded for good behavior will learn much more rapidly and retain what it learns far more effectively than an animal punished for bad behavior. Later studies have shown that the same applies to humans. By criticizing, we do not make lasting changes and often incur resentment. Hans Selye, another great psychologist, said, as much as we thirst for approval, we dread condemnation. The resentment that criticism engenders can demoralize employees, family members, and friends, and still not correct the situation that has been condemned. George B. Johnston of Enid, Oklahoma, is the safety coordinator for an engineering company. One of his responsibilities is to see that employees wear their hard hats whenever they are on a job in the field. He reported that whenever he came across workers who were not wearing hard hats, he would tell them with a lot of authority of the regulation and that they must comply. As a result, he would get sullen acceptance, and often after he left, the workers would remove the hats. He decided to try a different approach. The next time he found some of the workers not wearing their hard hat, he asked if the hats were uncomfortable or didn't fit properly. Then he reminded the men in a pleasant tone of voice that the hat was designed to protect them from injury and suggested that it always be worn on the job. The result was increased compliance with the regulation with no resentment or emotional upset. You will find examples of the futility of criticism bristling on a thousand pages of history. Take, for example, the famous quarrel between Theodore Roosevelt and President Taft. The quarrel that split the Republican Party put Woodrow Wilson in the White House and wrote bold, luminous lines across the First World War and altered the flow of history. Now let's review the facts quickly. When Theodore Roosevelt stepped out of the White House in 1908, he supported Taft, who was elected president. Then Theodore Roosevelt went off to Africa to shoot lions. When he returned, he exploded. He denounced Taft for his conservatism tried to secure the nomination for a third term himself, formed the Bull Moose Party, and all but demolished the GOP. In the election that followed, William Howard Taft and the Republican Party carried only two states, Vermont and Utah, the most disastrous defeat the party had ever known. Theodore Roosevelt blamed Taft, but did President Taft blame himself? Of course not. With tears in his eyes, Taft said, I don't see how I could have done any differently from what I have. Well, who was to blame, Roosevelt or Taft? 
Frankly, I don't know, and I don't care. The point I'm trying to make is that all of Theodore Roosevelt's criticism didn't persuade Taft that he was wrong. It merely made Taft strive to justify himself and to reiterate with tears in his eyes, I don't see how I could have done any differently from what I have. Or take the Teapot Dome oil scandal. It kept the newspapers ringing with indignation in the early 1920s. It rocked the nation. Within the memory of living men, nothing like it had ever happened before in American public life. Now here are the bare facts of the scandal. Albert B. Fall, Secretary of the Interior in Harding's cabinet, was entrusted with the leasing of government oil reserves at Elk Hill and Teapot Dome, oil reserves that had been set aside for the future of the Navy. Did Secretary Fall permit competitive bidding? No, sir. He handed the fat, juicy contract outright to his friend Edward L. Doheny. What did Doheny do? He gave Secretary Fall what he was pleased to call a loan of $100,000. Then, in a high-handed manner, Secretary Fall ordered United States Marines into the district to drive off competitors whose adjacent wells were sapping oil out of the Elk Hill reserves. These competitors, driven off their ground at the ends of guns and bayonets, rushed into court and blew the lid off the Teapot Dome scandal. A stench arose so vile that it ruined the Harding administration, nauseated an entire nation, threatened to wreck the Republican Party, and put Albert B. Fall behind prison bars. Fall was condemned viciously, condemned as few men in public life have ever been. Did he repent? Never. Years later, Herbert Hoover intimated in a public speech that President Harding's death had been due to mental anxiety and worry because a friend had betrayed him. When Mrs. Fall heard that, she sprang from her chair. She wept. She shook her fists at fate and screamed, What? Harding betrayed by Fall? No, my husband never betrayed anyone. This whole house full of gold would not tempt my husband to do wrong. He is the one who has been betrayed and led to the slaughter and crucified. And there you are, human nature in action wrongdoers blaming everybody but themselves. We are all like that. So when you and I are tempted to criticize someone tomorrow, let's remember Al Capone, Two-Gun Crowley, and Albert Fall. Let's realize that criticisms are like homing pigeons. They always return home. Let's realize that the person we're going to correct and condemn will probably justify himself or herself and condemn us in return or, like the gentle Taft, will say, I don't see how I could have done any differently. One love. Now, this is like the other side, the crucial confrontations. This is saying, look, sometimes persons might resent you because you had that confrontation with them. They might resent you because you condemn the things that they might have done in a particular manner. You might have condemned something that might trigger them to find something to condemn within you. And then there's a tit for tat. Even with children, as the book was pointing out, it's best sometimes, you know, in, in Guyana, don't play around. Car, anytime you play around, you got some lash forget. You know what I'm saying? As a youth growing up, we were scolded in that way, and you were scolded in other ways too, but that way was mostly the way that things was dealt with. Who knows about them times, you know what I'm saying, is real seriousness. And the book is saying, look, children, just remember and learn and change in the direction that you want to go better. If you use a reward versus punishment, friends as well too is saying watch don't condemn certain things with your friends because they might resent you and then you might lose an ally that you once had and then what about your spouse what about the person that you share those intimate intricate moments in your life with how do you now deal with a crucial confrontation and condemnation and resentment in that way you see how to win friends and influence people. 
very impactful, very insightful book, giving you insights into life, changing lessons, things to better your life, things to put you in a place where you can enjoy this experience, man. Right? Condemnation and resentment. Even in the situation with, let me look at it from a situation that's in the public eye with VP Jack Dio and Mr. Benchka, right? Now, whoever could remember long enough, they're going to remember the resentment that came because of the condemnation from Benchka. They're going to remember the resentment that came because of the condemnation that Bench Cup was, you know what I'm saying? Because of a Bench Cup, the fire that Bench Cup was pushing. Up. Look at how from those videos that used to come on. I think it's Channel 9, if I'm not mistaken, back then. And then look at what came afterward. Look at the resentment that came from that, allegedly. Allegedly. And then if we consider, on the other hand, as a dean and critic, and how well their friendship was flowing until condemnation. Hey, don't call people this and don't call people that. Resentment. Who's you for telling me this? Who's you for telling me that? You's not no paragon of virtue. You can't tell me that, 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 that. And then the mud slinging back and forth. How to win friends and influence people. One love. I'll catch you in the next flight. And if you have any suggestions for books that you might have read that you think we should bring to the channel and we all investigate, then please drop it in the comments and then do remember to hit the like button and the subscription button. Hit the like button, hit the like button and send this one out in the algorithm. She's ready. Stay ready. Mr. The ultimate male supplement, men's total wellness formula, Packed with essential nutrients for men's health. She'll call you Mr. C. We cannot help wanting to be all that we can be. Success in life is becoming what you want to be. You can become what you want to be only by making use of things. And you can have the free use of things only as you become rich enough to buy them. To understand the science of getting rich is therefore the most essential of all knowledge.